Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the Marketing Director here at the Academy. Today, we will be discussing some updates on the East Palestine train derailment incident. Our Executive Director, Dr. Daniel Uther, will serve as the moderator today. During the presentation, you'll be able to submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Before we get started, Dr. Uther would like to say a few words. Dan, how are you? I am great, Marissa. Thank you. I think my video is actually disabled right now. If you might want to be able to activate that, that'd be great. Thank you. There we go. Oh, still telling me, unable to start. Now you're going to see my you're going to see my sad face. <laughs> is it working for you? I don't see anything. How about if you just make me the co-host? That might work. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate it. Marissa, I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. We've got an exciting and timely webinar today. We've got a real special treat. Today's webinar is being offered by the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists in cooperation with the National Environmental Health Association, or NEHA. NEHA and the Academy have a long relationship. Uh, it goes back many years. NEHA is an affiliate organization uh, of the Academy. You, for those of you that are Academy members, you know of sponsoring organizations. We also have affiliate organizations. And so I'm really excited to be able to offer this webinar in cooperation with NEHA. As we begin, I want to take a moment to say thanks to the patrons of the Academy shown here on this screen. These are the companies and utilities that provide the financial support that helps operate the Academy. Their commitment to the profession is essential to our financial health. It supports our programs like these webinars, as well as outreach to the future workforce. Today, it's my pleasure to share that we have a number of folks to introduce as part of the webinar. Uh, gentlemen, if you want to go ahead and start getting your cameras going, just so we can verify we've got those. So we're going to have Jim Fitzgerald. Jim's a board-certified environmental engineer, and he chairs our site remediation committee. And I'm going to ask Jim to say a few words about the work of his committee and our relationship with the EPA in just a few minutes. Next, we have Dr. Dave Dijak. Dave is a good friend. He is the chief executive officer of the National Environmental Health Association. He's been protecting environmental health for decades. And Dave is actually going to handle our formal introduction of our highlight or our keynote speaker. And that's Mark Durno of the EPA. Mark's an engineer. He's been leading the efforts in East Palestine, Ohio, after a train derailment about six months ago resulted in some environmental health threats and the responses that have gone on in response to that derailment. Today, our audience includes members of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists and members of the National Environmental Health Association. So Dave Dijak and I will co-moderate the discussion at the end, and I'd just like to say welcome to everyone. As a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice this QA function. That's where you put your questions. Feel free to put them in there throughout the webinar. Dave and I will be, I'll be monitoring them. We'll pull those questions together and have some moderated discussion at the end. Jim, I'm going to ask you to say a few words and then hand it off to Dave to talk about Niha and to introduce Mark. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, and few words is the operative uh, term here. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm the chair of the Site Remediation Committee, which is one of the specialty certifications that the Academy offers. And about uh, late last year, uh, at the, I'll call it the initiation of uh, efforts by Dr. Glenn Paulson, we, um, we proposed reaching out to EPA to expand and uh, re reinvigorate our relationship, which had gone somewhat dormant in the uh, in the previous years. And I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, EPA uh, responded in the affirmative 
And this is basically the first manifestation of that uh, rekindling of that relationship as we go forward. And I really appreciate Dan and Dave's efforts to work um, with Mark to put this together. And with that, um, Dave, I'll pass it to you. And I'm looking forward to uh, Mark's presentation and in, in the detail is gonna be involved. Likewise, and, and thanks Jim and Dan and, and Marissa. Uh, the National Environmental Health Association is privileged to be a part of the mix today. Thank you so much for including us uh, as part of this activity. Uh, you know, Dan is a professor you understand that we talk a lot about transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary activities. Well, for the 128 people that are currently logged in, this is a classic case of that. If you look at the screen, you see environmental health, you see engineering, you see the public sector, you see the private sector, you see health and safety, and you see uh, a variety of other players that contribute to the health, safety, and financial security of the country. And with that, this is a case study of how collaboration across the disciplines is supposed to look. So thank you so much for creating the opportunity. It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Mark Derno. And Mark, it is a privilege and I'm wearing a bow tie on your behalf. I said that earlier, but I, I wanted you to know out of respect uh, for you and your efforts over a long career, uh, we applaud what you have done in this in this particular case study, as well as a long career in environmental engineering. Mark received a Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from the Rose Holman Institute of Technology. At the US EPA, Mark has served as the on-scene coordinator, supervisor, and deputy chief in the emergency response branch of the Superfund program in Region 5 since 1997. He currently serves as the Regional Homeland Security Advisor. As part of his Homeland Security work, Mark coordinates Region 5's continuity of operations and disaster recovery programs. Mark, you are stationed in EPA's Westlake, Ohio office, and I hope that's a great place uh, to be. Mark was named EPA's National On-Scene Coordinator of the Year in 2007. He received a gold medal for exceptional service in 2017 and received EPA's National Homeland Security Award in 2022. What a phenomenal career, sir. Thank you for your service. And with that introduction, we're gonna turn it over to you, Mark. Hi, um, wow, uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate that, uh, a very kind introduction. And um, and good morning uh, to uh, everyone on the East Coast and to, I'm sorry, good afternoon to everybody on the East Coast and good morning to the rest of you. Um, so I'm going to offer a, an early apology. Um, you know, we're still uh, we're still working 12 to 14 hours a day out here in East Palestine and um, um, uh, coming to you from uh, our command post. And um, I did, really didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare for this. So you're going to get uh, you're going to get the raw and uh, uncensored version of, uh, of uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the progress that we've made uh, on the uh, East Palestine uh, trained around an emergency. Um, to give a, a little bit more uh, information on, on my role out here, I'm one of four primary coordinators that EPA has deployed. Um, two of us, uh, our incident commander, uh, Mr. Ralph Delhoff, and I uh, are out here full time. Uh, we've been here since February. And uh, the other two, our, our two deputy uh, incident commanders, uh, are uh, are out here. They, they, they alternate. And when we get to the lessons learned portion, portion of this discussion, one of the uh, keys uh, to a successful response is continuity. And um, uh, and we'll talk about that more later. But uh, again, I just want to let you know that it's it is a it is a team effort here at the at the leadership level, but it's also a pretty amazing team effort. Um, you know, uh, you know, throughout uh, our entire unified command structure, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. Um, the, the, all four of us are on scene coordinators. We're uh, we're uh, we're uh, uh, certified on scene coordinators with US EPA. And the on scene coordinator is responsible for uh, ensuring that we carry out the duties in emergency response as uh, directed in the national contingency plan. And uh, typically, that work is uh, your garden variety, oil, uh, chemical spills. Uh, we also deal with time critical cleanups. Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, abandoned hazardous waste is discovered, and uh, our state or local partners don't have the uh, ability or means to uh, deal with it. Uh, we get called in. And there's also a huge enforcement component to this as well. 
Uh, and uh, in this case, um, you know, we are enforcing uh, against uh, the uh, the polluter, uh, the uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad. Um, but Norfolk Southern is in unified command with us. And I'll explain the, the nuance of how that works uh, here in a moment. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the images you see on the scene is really the, uh, the primary reason uh, that uh, this became a uh, national and international uh, story and situation. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, there, there was an exceptional uh, fire and train derailment. Interestingly, uh, we did the math on this, uh, and if that train uh, would have derailed six seconds later, uh, it would have been in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. If it would have uh, derailed six seconds earlier, uh, it would have been right in the heart of downtown East Palestine, and the dev devastation would have been much worse. Uh, so, um, so we kind of got the uh, you know the middle the middle of the road in terms of uh, of, of uh, potential damage. Uh, but it's also important to note uh, that there was not one fatality uh, in this incident. Uh, we recognize that there are ongoing health concerns for many of the uh, residents uh, that have been exposed uh, to uh, chemicals uh, that released from this uh, from this uh, incident. Uh, but I, again, it is important to note that as as much attention and as uh, large as this response is, uh, there were no fatalities. Um, the last uh, last. Statement I want to make about uh, the early days of the response is, uh, again, you know the story. Um, on February 3rd, uh, this derailment happened. Uh, there was, uh, the, the images uh, from the initial derailment uh, were pretty spectacular, as you can see from the right side of your screen. Um, it, the, uh, the winds were variable. Uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of on-site and off-site exposure to potential uh, hazardous materials. Uh, and then uh, two and a half days later, there was a decision made to uh, what they call vent and burn the, uh, uh, the five vinyl chloride tanks um, uh, that at the time we believed uh, were a threat uh, to, uh, to blevy or to explode and, um, you know, and send a, a, a toxic cloud of uh, vinyl chloride, phosgene and hydrogen chloride into the nearby communities. So um, the, uh, the decision to vent and burn uh, was one that got a lot of headlines. I'm sure you're, uh, if you've been following this story, um, uh, you, you've heard that. Um, at the recent NTSB hearings uh, here in East Palestine, uh, you heard that there was some discrepancies between uh, the experts on scene that were giving it advice and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, the manufacturers of the of the material and what uh, they felt uh, were the status of those rail cars. But at the end of the day, the modeling that we did, uh, if uh, in the event that these rail cars would have uh, uh, exploded, uh, would have been devastating. So um, regardless of uh, whether or not the decision was appropriate. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we were able to uh, respond to this uh, with zero loss of life. So, um, again, there's just a, a kind of a close up of the uh, derailment site uh, a few days after the vent and burn, and uh, that, that, that image will uh, become more apparent here in a moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Unified Command. Um, a unified Command is a, 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 a it's a, uh, through the National Incident Management System, it's uh, the required structure for managing large, large scale emergency responses. Uh, here at EPA, uh, after the 9-11 uh, incidents and the, uh, uh, the anthrax attacks on, on Capitol Hill and, and other locations, we, uh, uh, we adopted, fully adopted the Incident Command System as a, a management structure for, uh, you know, for nationally significant responses and large responses. And even uh, at EPA, we adopt the system now for some of our regional, regionally significant and medium uh, responses uh, because it does provide a very important framework uh, for all relevant agencies to work together. As you can see from the screen, uh, we have the Village of East Palestine, the Columbiana County Emergency Management Agency, the Ohio Emergency Environmental Protection Agency, uh, US EPA at the time, both Region 5 and Region 3, which covers Ohio and Pennsylvania, and Norfolk Southern Railroad. Um, and again, we uh, we brought Norfolk Southern in as a unified command member because uh, under our administrative order, uh, which you can see on the slide now, uh, they are responsible for implementing all the work activities. Um, and on the, on the right side of the screen, you see all the appendices uh, that uh, fall into the main work plan that was required of Norfolk Southern to, uh, to carry out uh, uh, with uh, with respect to uh, response and cleanup to the train department. And as you can see, it's quite extensive. Uh, this is probably the hardest job I've ever worked. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing this uh, since the early 90s. I've been with EPA since 97. Um, and uh, and I I had the, uh, uh, the opportunity to be the lead responder on the Flint drinking water uh, response back in 2016. 
um, this one far exceeds the challenges uh, that we had in, um, in some of these other major disasters uh, that I've worked for two reasons. Uh, the, uh, the primary reason is what you see on the right side of the screen. This was a multimedia response uh, where uh, we had uh, where we required extensive um, soil monitoring, soil cleanup, groundwater monitoring, sentinel uh, well uh, monitoring, um, uh, uh, surface water and uh, municipal drinking water monitoring, uh, an extensive air monitoring sampling uh, network, uh, and um, uh, and the uh, community involvement uh, and um, uh, public information side of this thing was was off the charts. And I, again, I'll explain a lot more of that uh, in a moment. This uh, order was established on uh, February 21st and became effective on February 25th. And Norfolk Southern has been compliant with the order uh, ever since. On a given daily basis, uh, Norfolk Southern has uh, uh, over 100 people working on this job site. Uh, again, daily, um, US EPA uh, and its uh, support uh, contractors uh, have anywhere from 80 to 120 people working on site every day. And then our support agencies, not just our primary unified command uh, agencies, but our support agencies um, are, uh, have extensive presence on this site as well. Um, you know, first and foremost, EPA's responsibility is the protection of public health in the environment. So let's talk public health first. Uh, within the Unified Command Team, um, uh, as the emergency phase of this uh, wound down and we've been in the, lo the longer term cleanup phase, um, uh, uh, under the Unified Command uh, uh, organization, we established a public health advisory unit. So all of our local, state, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, support public health agencies and organizations uh, convene regularly. Um, back uh, close to the emergency phase of this incident, uh, we were convening uh, on a daily basis um, and that, that, that has now been reduced to a weekly basis. Uh, but there are, are always public health topics uh, for us to uh, discuss and, um, and take action on where necessary. Um, a, a number of independent initiatives related to public health have been happening. Uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, are going to be putting on an independent workshop to evaluate potential health research needs uh, under, the, uh, under a contract with the National Institutes of Health. In addition, the University of Kentucky is working uh, uh, through a health research grant uh, to uh, also support health initiatives through the National Institutes of Health. And then uh, independent of NIH, uh, there are also several academic institutes, uh, institutions conducting um, independent research. There are also third party organizations conducting research, but uh, we're more linked in with the, uh, the academic institutions. And just to give you a, a, just a small sample size of uh, some of the academic partners out here that are, are they're working independently, but they're providing very valuable data to the uh, uh, to the response. Um, Carnegie Mellon University, Texas A&M University doing um, uh, some advanced air monitoring and sampling. Uh, Kent State uh, University in coordination with Louisiana State are doing some uh, uh, soil evaluation work uh, on, on site. Uh, the Ohio State University and Penn State University did uh, some uh, agricultural uh, plant tissue sampling support. Case Western University is doing some health-based DNA research. Wayne State University and Duquesne University have been doing uh, some uh, lab analytical and coordination work for some third-party uh, researchers in town. So that's just a small sample size of uh, some of the uh, support that we've gotten independently uh, from, uh, uh, from our, our, our work out here. In addition to that, the Columbiana County Emergency Management Agency, uh, in coordination with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, have instituted a potable water sampling program. And this is strictly for private wells. Uh, but as you can see in the bullet, um, over 860 private wells have been sampled to date. And, um, and that includes 24, uh, includes 24 rounds of public uh, water supply sampling that Ohio EPA uh, is managing. But that's extremely significant because to date, we have seen no chemicals of concern uh, at levels uh, anywhere close to uh, maximum contaminant levels uh, in wells. As a matter of fact, the majority of the potable well samples that have come back have come back either non-detect or um, uh, any detections at low levels are for non-derailment related um, compounds. So uh, we are very confident in the uh, health of groundwater, uh, but uh, but as, as we all know uh, in this business, uh, groundwater can be threatened at any time um, uh, from, from contamination that might be missed. And we'll talk a little bit more, more about that when we get into the soil piece of this. One of the early issues on site uh, was, uh, was obviously the uh, air releases from the fire and the, the extensive amount of um, uh, chemicals uh, that were released. Uh, the primary chemicals of concern uh, were uh, N-butyl acrylate, ethyl hexoacrylate, 
two butoxyethanol and and of course vinyl chloride which was vented and burned um you know the vinyl chloride alone were, were uh, i think it was over 9000 pounds of material again most of that burned up but we did see some levels of vinyl chloride uh in uh in our nearby streams and we also saw it quite extensively in uh, in soils along the rail tracks um but in order to be protective of public health, it was extremely important to set up what we call the wall of protection from the derailment site. And I know this uh, small graphic is hard to see, but uh, the the yellow dot uh, on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, the graphic itself is a train derailment location. Uh, to the east of the train derailment location, or to the right, uh, is uh, the Pennsylvania State Line and Pennsylvania. Now there are not uh, very many residents out here, so we targeted our air sampling and air monitoring stations to where those residential properties were, but it's mostly uh, open open country and agricultural lands out there. To the, uh, to the west or to the left is the village of East Palestine. And early in the project, as you can see, we set up air monitoring and air sampling stations um, throughout the village, uh, again, to provide that uh, wall of protection. In addition to that, on the, uh, bottom, uh, on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you see our trace atmosphere gas analyzer. Um, which is a, a, a mobile uh, gas chromatograph uh, mass spectrometry uh, unit uh, that collects real-time uh, data. And we had it calibrated depending on uh, the phase of the cleanup to either uh, vinyl chloride or butyl acrylate so that we could have real-time analytical uh, data um, uh, and, and provide that extra wall of protection uh, for air monitoring uh, in the community. <clears throat> We're happy to say that we've seen no sustained exceedances of uh, any of our um, uh, priority monitoring points or, um, or through our sampling efforts of any uh, priority uh, compounds uh, since the evacuation was lifted. We have seen compounds, uh, but uh, uh, they, uh, they come and go pretty fast uh, as excavation is going on and vapors are generated. We do have significant engineering controls on scene to control vapors at the, uh, at the, at the excavation scenes. Uh, in the event that uh, any sustained um, uh, levels uh, were present in the community. But again, we never saw any. Um, but uh, the, the data points are pretty remarkable. Um, you know, we've, been, uh, we've been doing this um, extensive air sampling uh, for, uh, for over 180 days. Um, we've collected over 1 million, 100 million discrete measurements. Uh, and we've, we've also collected over uh, 17,000 uh, air samples, which translates into over half a million uh, analytical data points, uh, which is uh, uh, which is pretty remarkable uh, given uh, given the time frame here. Um, uh, and again, I mentioned the uh, the primary contaminants, uh, vinyl chloride and, and butyl acrylate. To a lesser extent, the ethyl hexyl acrylate um, have been uh, thoroughly monitored uh, and sampled. Um, uh, as you can imagine, with the number of people that I mentioned earlier, uh, our health and safety plan needed to be very extensive. Um, we're happy to report that um, uh, over 500,000 person hours of work, and we have not had any serious incidents. A couple minor incidents, uh, a couple bumps and bruises, um, uh, and uh, we did have one uh, incident where we were um, uh, doing some what we call air knifing in uh, sediment. And we hit a pocket of contaminants that didn't have anything to do with the uh, uh, the realma site, and we think we uh, released some hydrogen sulfide. Um, it could have been naturally occurring, could have been from um, some past industrial practices in that area, um, and uh, that caused a safety shutdown. Uh, and um, we changed our tactics uh, for uh, for uh, uh, for doing uh, sediment cleanup work in the nearby ditches and streams uh, after that uh, particular incident. Again, because we are working in a commercial industrial area uh, for most of this. Uh, we've had, uh, we integrated OSHA. We knew this was going to be a big one and it was going to be under a microscope. So we integrated OSHA into Unified Command uh, back in February uh, and they've been a partner of ours ever since. Uh, and, and I think having that uh, that presence on the ground and, do, and having our site safety officer on the ground, uh, not in an office trailer, has made a huge difference uh, in, uh, in our safety practices uh, and our, and our uh, uh, very, uh, very excellent track record of not having injuries. Um, and uh, we've been conducting safety audits routinely on, on the job site. So safety, uh, safety is a priority. One of the first um, uh, uh, public concerns with respect to this response was the idea that the vinyl chloride, um, when being incinerated, would cause um, uh, downwind um, dioxin hazards. Um, you know, we did the uh, we did the science on this. We uh, we did the math. We did the calculations uh, based on a maximum burn of the vinyl chloride. Again, about nine hundred thousand pounds of vinyl chloride. Um, we determined based on uh, you know based on uh, 
combustion uh, chemical calculations that we probably end up with somewhere between 40 and 50 um, uh, grams of dioxin, total dioxin compounds being generated. And, you know, uh, if you look at the plume uh, uh, in the plume map uh, in a downwind particulate distribution, um, uh, I'm sorry, de deposition uh, that we were seeing, you're looking at uh, 40 to 50 grams over, uh, let's say, a 50 to 60 square mile area. That doesn't seem to be, uh, doesn't seem like there would be very much impact there. However, um, uh, the uh, the elect or elected leaders, um, our officials, uh, the community, um, they wanted a thorough uh, investigation uh, with respect to dio potential dioxin contamination um, in the environment. So we looked at it from a different perspective. Uh, we wanted to look at um, uh, the most likely chemical compounds uh, that would uh, would fall out in particulate matter uh, from this uh, response. So we selected um, uh, some semi-volatile organics or, or polyaromatic hydrocarbons in, a, in association with dioxin uh, uh, sampling. Long story short, uh, we completed um, a first phase of this um, uh, this assessment, looking at both uh, first uh, top uh, first inch of soil and also um, the the five inches below um, uh, in discrete samples, and we determined uh, that there was no um, no uh, dioxin contamination or polyaromatic hydrocarbon semi-volatile organic uh, impacts um, that would exceed typical background conditions for both rural um, uh, properties, uh, you know, our agricultural, recreational lands, and also uh, urban, suburban, um, residential and commercial properties. We did have a few outliers. Uh, 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 we've had a few hits that were above those uh, typical background levels, but they are all associated with public right away. They were collected on the roadside. If we couldn't get access to a particular property uh, that we were interested in inspecting and collecting uh, samples on, then we, uh, uh, we collected it from the public right away in the interest of time. And as a result, uh, we did see some uh, some roadside contamination influence those samples. At least that was our conclusion based on uh, those four locations that were uh, 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 higher than we would expect them to see. So that was uh, off-site soil sampling, but that, that was important to get a jump on that early in this response because uh, there were uh, uh, significant concerns from the agricultural community and uh, the vendors, um, you know, the, uh, their uh, their customers. Uh, that, that there, there was a concern that you know the consumer confidence would be low uh, based on this uh, the derailment situation and uh, the significant amount of misinformation that was being shared about the derailment uh, situation. So, so this soil sampling program, coupled with uh, the plant tissue sampling that was done, uh, provided a lot of confidence to uh, to the public. And um, uh, according to our agricultural pro uh, partners, uh, the uh, uh, business is back to normal. But let's turn our attention to the actual site itself now. Um, the main line, main, line, so, main line soil removal uh, program was um, you know, the most significant um, uh, piece of this response in terms of uh, just uh, you know work activity and volume. Um, and you'll see the statistics here in a moment. But just from these photos, you can see what the uh, process looked like. Um, the uh, areas under the uh, tracks, um, and we, we did one side of the tracks, then the other side of the tracks and the center line um, yeah, independently. So, um, uh, so train traffic could continue to move uh, while this cleanup was being conducted. Um, on the right side of the picture, you can see the, uh, the lifts, uh, the lifts that were being done to remove contaminated soil. Um, after a lift was uh, completed in a 50 or 25 um, uh, 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 square foot area, uh, samples would be collected uh, to determine whether or not priority contaminants were still present. Uh, if they were still present, we would dig dig, uh, dig down uh, another foot and then collect samples again. Um, we were um, cleaning up to groundwater standards. And this is important because we're doing this under uh, EPA's removal action uh, authority. And um, removal action numbers aren't as uh, extensive as, um, as, as long-term cleanup standards. But because we knew that this area was going to be um, you know, reestablished with the railroad track and uh, we uh, looked at uh, applicable uh, and relevant uh, uh, regulations, Ohio EPA suggested ground, uh, cleaning up the groundwater standards, which we did. So um, you know, the resulting uh, clay underneath the, uh, the rail bed uh, has been uh, cleaned up uh, to, to those standards. And so we're very confident uh, that groundwater uh, from the areas underneath the tracks will not be threatened. And as you can see from the bottom, uh, all those green blocks that you see in the images at the bottom, uh, that uh, uh, those would be red if there was still contamination present, and they turned green uh, when the uh, uh, when results came back uh, clear. As you can see from the images, 
um, uh, all those uh, units um, have uh, been have been completed, and uh, both uh, both uh, tracks uh, the tracks in both directions have been moving since uh, the end of June. Uh, so that piece of the uh, work has been done, and this is just another image of that area. Um, you can see the uh, the rail bed um, the being reestablished. On the right side of that picture, um, you can see some indentations in the uh, uh, in the soil. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, the area that I'm, I'm circling right now, that was uh, one of the burn pits uh, where the uh, vent and burn operation happened. And the other burn pit uh, was uh, just uh, just down, uh, down uh, just to the east of that location. And um, uh, those areas we had to dig deeper uh, because that's where the vinyl chloride was released into and it, it soaked a little bit deeper into the soil. Beneath the tracks, uh, we ended up uh, excavating anywhere between four feet and 11 feet uh, beneath the ground surface. Uh, and um, uh, we had to go deeper in areas where um, uh, we were on the east end of the, this half mile long uh, excavation area, uh, mainly because of water infiltration uh, and um, you know, through the excavation process, contaminants would get driven deeper uh, into soils uh, because those areas were so wet. So um, uh, you know, a little bit more waste was generated uh, just because of uh, those site conditions. Um, so this is just a, a, an image of the uh, uh, derailment uh, area excavations early on. Again, about a half mile of the of, uh, areas under the tracks were cleaned up. Uh, the north ditch, uh, while that was happening, was cleaned up, uh, the north ditch next to the tracks. And what you can also see from this image is what we call car scrapping area number three. Uh, this was an area where um, burned out rail cars were drugged uh, and, uh, and, and cleaned up. Car scrapping area number three was just finished last week. Uh, so the only remaining cleanup area is car scrapping area number four in the South Ditch, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But again, this just gives you a, an overview of what the uh, site looks like. A couple of things to note here in this area. Uh, the uh, uh, a water treatment system has been established uh, in this area. Um, uh, you can't see the primary tanks. It's under underneath where it says North Ditch here. And our clean water tanks are sitting up on the on the top side of the picture. But also important uh, importantly is if you look uh, down um, on the uh, on the west side uh, of this image or the left side of this image, you see how close the residential some residential areas are to the derailment site. And um, uh, that's uh, those are areas uh, where uh, we have been keenly focused on uh, making sure that uh, you know their well being is uh, is being met, um, and we continue to be uh, very conscious about those who remain uh, living in that area while this construction is going on. Norfolk Southern has offered a voluntary relocation program for anybody who does not want to remain here. You know, while all this work is going on, while the potential for uh, vapors are being generated, and also uh, while dust uh, is being generated from our support zones. Um, just to give you a, a sense for the amount of work that's been done, and it's pretty impressive. Um, as of August 1st, we were at 88,000 tons of contaminated uh, uh, hazardous waste soil being uh, disposed of. Uh, that soil, the high organic uh, content material will go to incinerators, hazardous waste incinerators. Uh, the, uh, the more typical um, contaminated soil would uh, go to hazardous waste landfills. Uh, I think we're up to 89 and a half thousand tons now. Uh, liquid disposal, same thing. Uh, because we did have a lot of water infiltration issues um, on the east end of our uh, cleanup area, uh, over 29 million gallons uh, of, uh, of uh, hazardous waste liquid has been disposed of. We are planning to treat, uh, to send water off as, as non-hazardous uh, down the road here. And I'll talk about that here in a moment when we get to remaining work. So um, car scrapping area four. This is that uh, area that I, I mentioned that still needs to be cleaned up. This is the image right after um, uh, the vent and burn operation occurred. Uh, you can see um, you know, all, the, all the rail cars that are in this area. Um, and um, you can uh, understand why this area uh, would be contaminated. Um, we've been in a characterization mode for this area, collecting samples um, and um, at depth. And what we determined was we're probably going to have to dig down about five feet in this area to get out all the remaining contamination. We, ant we anticipate that that, uh, that area, as you can see outlined in red here in the image, will take about another month uh, to month and a half to complete. Uh, this area, instead of stockpiling and then shipping off site, uh, we're going to live load it. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, uh, as we do load out contaminated soils, um, and because of the uh, extreme sensitivity of uh, the community, and uh, as an addi additional safety measure, um, uh, all trucks that come onto the scene, regardless of whether or not they're um, you know, on the contaminated footprint or not, 
uh, get pressure washed uh, before they leave the scene. So a lot of the uh, uh, water that we're generating is from uh, the, the truck washing activities before they go onto area roads. Um, wastewater treatment. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, over 29 million gallon, gallons of water have been uh, uh, shipped off site uh, for deep water injection disposal. Uh, our, our program moving forward, once approved uh, by Ohio EPA and US EPA, which should be any day now, is for this uh, treatment system to become active. It's already been um, batch tested and it's ready to roll. Uh, we just need to get through a few last administrative pieces of the approval process. Once that happens, water will be treated on site. Um, it'll go in from our, from our storage tanks here, um, where you can see uh, tank farm number one, the big blue lake tanks, uh, through the treatment system into our effluent tanks. Uh, we'll uh, render that uh, uh, liquid uh, from uh, a hazardous waste uh, code um, uh, to a non-hazardous waste code. And um, even though that water will be uh, really clean, it'll still be treated as um, uh, as, uh, as wastewater and will have to be shipped off site to a, a non-haz uh, wastewater treatment facility. Uh, that's going to sig uh, significantly reduce truck traffic uh, in, in town, which will make the, the residents uh, in this area very, very happy. Um, and it also, um, yeah, again, ensure a, a more effective, a more cost effective um, action uh, for, uh, you know, for the company. In addition to that, you can, where my cursor is now, if you can see it, um, just south of the, uh, just, uh, yeah, south of these effluent tank farms, you can see where we've established um, uh, paved roads. Uh, dust has been a, uh, an issue within the community. Um, so uh, the company has uh, uh, paved a number of the areas where truck traffic is uh, is common uh, to reduce uh, or eliminate dust in many areas. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, commitments that EPA made early in this response was to clean structures, um, meaning uh, you know uh, homes uh, that were affected by smoke, uh, where they may have some particulate matter get into homes. Now again, this was February when this happened, so we wouldn't anticipate. Uh, much uh, uh, particles or soot to get into homes during that time. But it was there was a confidence piece to this uh, back in February uh, where uh, it, it'd be helpful if, you know, uh, folks could go into clean homes. Um, Norfolk Southern took uh, some early responsibility to do some uh, very limited cleaning in homes. Uh, and uh, EPA had been planning a more extensive cleaning program over the next several months. And um, uh, based on uh, the dust generation from our support zones, you know, plus uh, the fact that um, there are probably somewhere between 150 and 180 households uh, that are uh, currently um, uh, temporarily relocated. Um, we uh, we held off on the uh, on the structure cleaning program, and um, so when uh, folks uh, determined uh, community members determined it was time to go back into their uh, 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 residences. Uh, that they could uh, not only have uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the the early particulate matter dealt with, but also have uh, the dust issues dealt with um, through one thorough cleaning program. So uh, that process started on August 1st. We'll probably actually start cleaning homes uh, here next week. Um, the other activities that are going to be happening is uh, our final uh, soil assessment program, what we call uh, the full inspection um, uh, or full characterization uh, program. So all the areas uh, that um, are both highlighted, which you can see uh, North Ditch, South Ditch, the mainline track, that half mile, car scrapping area three, car scrapping area four, and then all these um, uh, shaded areas uh, north and south of the tracks that you can see in, in, in brown shading. Those are all areas that are going to get uh, extensively um, uh, sampled and characterized. Uh, as you can see um, from uh, the, uh, the sample plan um, uh, illustrated below, you know, over 2,500 uh, samples will be collected for VOC analysis. Um, and then uh, we also uh, will be looking at semi-volatiles, dioxins, uh, PFAS contamination, because there was a small amount of firefighting foam that may have contained PFAS uh, in the, uh, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the firefighting efforts early on. Um, this will give us an indication as to whether or not any contamination um, or, or hot spots remain either on site or in the uh, support areas. Anywhere that the, the uh, our actions touched will get cleaned up. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but there are two streams in town. One is called Sulphur Run and one is called Leslie Run uh, that are still, uh, they still have some level of contamination. Sulphur Run runs through the village of East Palestine, uh, and there are some areas that are still heavily contaminated. Um, uh, we conducted a full characterization uh, program on Sulphur Run uh, within uh, within the last month, 
we should have results back from that uh, uh, shortly. And then from there, we will determine whether or not um, uh, cleanup activity is going to be recommended. We anticipate that it will. Leslie run, uh, is, uh, runs uh, south of East Palestine and into the uh, uh, into the, uh, uh, the the more rural areas uh, in uh, in, uh, in this area, and it's a cold water habitat, and it, it's not nearly as contaminated. As a matter of fact, um, the only contam uh, the primary contaminated areas are up where the confluence of Sulphur Run and, and Leslie Run come together. Um, so we anticipate that there could be some cleanup activities in the upper stretches of Leslie Run, but our our ecological experts, uh, our state partners at Ohio Department of Natural Resources and Ohio EPA, uh, really don't want us uh, doing any invasive techniques uh, in this area. Uh, Leslie Run is a cold water habitat. There are some sensitive species and even one endangered species in this uh, yeah in this uh, watershed. So. Um, uh, so we're going to be a little bit more um, judicious about uh, what uh, decisions are made about Leslie Run. But fortunately, we're not seeing um, uh, the contamination profile, at least from a visual perspective, uh, that we saw um, even just a few months ago. So remaining work. Um, uh, we talked about structure cleaning in our, uh, in our south ditch and car scrapping area for excavation work. We anticipate that that's, uh, that could be done um, as soon as the end of September, but more realistically with um, you know, uh, unexpected delays probably into October. Uh, then we get into our, our long-term footprint. Uh, that, uh, that large uh, assessment or characterization effort um, is going to take months to complete. Um, again, with that many samples, uh, and the fact that we're going to be punching down um, at, uh, at, uh, at depths um, uh, and collecting further samples uh, will, will take us well into 2024, probably January or February. And then any site restoration that still needs to happen uh, will also happen um, in early 2024. But the majority of the work um, should be done this uh, early this fall. Uh, the major construction should be done. And we'll just be in, again, longer term assessment phase after that. Another component of this response uh, was uh, the pretty extensive community involvement um, uh, work that we established. You know, some of the work that we established was based on some of our lessons learned from the Flint drinking water response that we applied here um, early on. Um, uh, we, we established a welcome center right in downtown East Palestine. And since we've established that center, uh, we've had nearly a thousand visitors uh, for uh, residents gathering information. Um, we, we, we bring our technical staff in when needed and sit down and, and walk through the data and uh, information that we're collecting and, and help residents understand, help community members understand what we're doing. Uh, we fielded, in addition to the thousand visitors, we fielded over 1,100 calls. So um, we've had a lot of touches in the community based on, just based on this Welcome Center alone. Um, early in the response, we had weekly open houses for, uh, for uh, community members to get information, businesses to get information. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, then we shifted into a public information series. Um, and early on, we were doing weekly public information sessions, topic based on, on parts of the uh, cleanup. Uh, and um, all of these sessions were recorded and posted on our website. If you go to our, uh, the US EPA East Palestine response website, uh, you can find um, you know all those topics and uh, you know the uh, the presentations that we offered to community members and the questions and answers and some of them got pretty juicy uh, as you can imagine in a in a stressful situation. Um, we have engaged uh, the community. Uh, we established a community partners uh, program and that's uh, again that was one of our lessons learned from the Flint response. Um, and um, based on the response that we got back from uh, community leaders and community members. Um, we've um, uh, attended or supported over 30 public events um, since February. Uh, we, uh, we send out a biweekly newsletter to every resident in East Palestine and, um, and other areas affected by the derailment, uh, including Pennsylvania. Uh, we produce um, quick in the moment videos uh, to give, uh, give community members a snapshot of what's going on on site, um, quick 60 second videos. So, um, uh, and, uh, and we do, uh, uh, we're doing them, uh, we're doing a weekly, um, uh, we call it This Week in East Palestine video uh, that uh, you can also view on our website. And also um, we, uh, through this partnership, uh, we, we get leads from uh, our partners on community events that we may want to support or host. So, um, you know, we, we've got a, a pretty substantial um, uh, community involvement program going. At our Welcome Center, uh, we have no less than, um, you know, five, uh, five to eight people working um, at that Welcome Center every day. You know, even days where we don't get a lot of uh, input, uh, we're still working on, you know, updating, updating our information because it's, uh, this has been such a dynamic site. 
So that's that's where we are with the site. That's just a quick snapshot. I could probably talk about um, uh, many of these uh, components for <laughs> for a couple hours each, but I, I did want to just take this opportunity and, and take a quick look back. Um, you know, what were some of the areas where you know we we were challenged early on, and where, where are some of those areas that we had some successes early on that were worth noting? Um, yeah, and you know, every lessons learned discussion always starts with communications, and uh, this was no different. Um, you know, during during the emergency phase of this response, and especially uh, when the evacuation was lifted, and there there were still unpleasant odors uh, in the community. Um, you know, there were still low level contaminants um, in the air. Um, you know, uh, using terms like safe um, are, are very dangerous terms to use because um, you know when uh, when the air quality doesn't seem right, and uh, the uh, uh, and and we're you know, we're doing an about face and telling the community that everything's okay. Uh, instead of being a little bit more technical, you know, I, we don't need to we don't need to uh, dumb our our communications down to one word and, and use the word safe. Well, we should be a little bit more communicative on on what the, the status of air quality is uh, when uh, when something like an evacuation is lifted for something this big. So, you know, I would challenge our agency uh, to relook at how we you know communicate safety in communities and be a, again a be, don't be afraid to be a little bit more technical um you know we don't need to you know we don't need to uh, speak at a uh, you know uh, uh, say at a third grade level every time we talk we we should we you know um we should talk a little bit more clearly um i, I mentioned the longer term community engagement program that we did i think that was one of the glaring successes of uh, this response um, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you um, early on, you know, how many people, you know, expressed fear and concern and in many cases, anger with what was going on. But we're still here. And those same people often come in uh, and bring us cookies <laughs> in our welcome center. I, I mean, just being here, being part of the community, uh, integrating with the community um, has, um, you know, has proven to be a, a real success uh, in this, on this response. Um, misinformation uh, hit was one of the biggest challenges early on. Um, uh, you know, we learned this during the COVID uh, era, uh, you know, that, uh, that anybody in an echo chamber uh, is going to get their information from very non-credible sources. Uh, you know, we heard reports of, uh, of bots being used to uh, influence social media across the globe. Um, I, I think at one point, uh, this response was being compared to a little Chernobyl, um, which is, you know, uh, technically ridiculous and absurd. But nonetheless, um, those were some of the stories that would be perpetuated and, uh, you know, and creating fear, um, distrust and anger uh, within within the community. And that's where, you know, again, a lot of our a lot of our uh, partners, a lot of the, uh, you know, our our respected engineers and scientists, people like yourselves have been very helpful um, in helping combat a lot of that misinformation. But on the other hand, uh, we've had uh, you know, we've had some uh, some reputable names. Um, you know, uh, be uh, highly critical of some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, and that has, you know, fueled some of that mistrust. And that, that's been a hard, uh, that's been a hard issue to deal with. So, um, you know, so again, misinformation continues, uh, even to this day, to be a, uh, be a challenge for us on this response. Not as bad as it was early on, but um, it, it's something we're going to have to figure out uh, as, a, as a federal family, um, as a technical family, to um, you know, to get uh, the right information out uh, in in a better manner. Um, uh, during the NTSB hearings, uh, I think you heard uh, Chief Drabeck, the incident, the, the local incident commander, who's part of our unified command team, talk about the need for training and exercises. And you know, uh, in this new age of um, of uh, more disasters happening, uh, training and exercises, I think, are going to be um, uh, you know start to rise even more to the forefront than they already were. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I can only emphasize that uh, so much that we need to we need to meet our partners um, in training exercises, not uh, not on a, a major incident uh, like the one we just had. Technology and resources. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned our uh, trace atmospheric gas analyzer. Uh, we actually demobilized that thing because uh, we were able to bring out <clears throat> some mobile uh, 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 analytical um, the units called uh, proton, proton transfer. Uh, reaction mass spectrometry or PTRMS uh, units. Um, we've been using the PTRMS mobile units to do our uh, roadside uh, mobile monitoring. They're the same units that uh, the Carnegie Mellon and Texas A&M team used to do some evaluation of the uh, of the site in the early days, uh, which again provided uh, a very useful data. 
Um, so um, just um, recognizing that, um, you know, that uh, even though we have some classic, you know, um, uh, innovative technology that we've been using, there's always room uh, to bring um, uh, redundant technology like the PTRMS uh, into the scene. And, and part of the, you know, part of the training and exercise um, paradigm, I think, could be to use not just not just getting first responders out, um, but also getting um, support responders out uh, to utilize technology in a training man, uh, uh, as a training measure uh, prior to uh, one of these incidents happening. And you heard me mention earlier about continuity. Um, we have a, a, a core team of us uh, that are here. I'd say six to eight of us uh, that have been here since the beginning, and we're going to be here till this thing is uh, wrapped up. At least the major construction piece of this is wrapped up. And um, uh, you know we're the we're the glue that has kept us together, but it's been a challenge. And I, I mentioned earlier this is probably one of the hardest jobs. It is the hardest job I've ever worked, and it's because um, you know because all of all the you know all the uh, uh, complicated and complex issues uh, uh, that were stacking on top of each other, and then having you know in in disaster response we you know we rotate personnel out every two to three weeks, and that's hard. It's hard to bring. Um, uh, especially on a technologically complex site, uh, bringing new people in and bringing them up to speed uh, and making sure they know all the nuances of, of the response actions that we're taking. And then lastly, just taking a quick look forward, um, you know, we recognize that, um, that, you know, there's no, it's no secret that we have an increasing number of emergencies and disasters. Uh, this was a good example. Uh, we had this train derailment happen and a month later, we had a major uh, warehouse fire happen in, 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 in Indiana. And our resources were already depleted within the region, um, uh, and we we had to respond to another major fire. You, you see what's going on right now in Hawaii, and what I'm hearing is we're going to have an extensive, uh, uh, a higher than normal hurricane season this year. So uh, that provides a number of internal resource challenges, provides um, uh, uh, significant need for external resources. That's where you all come in. Um, uh, don't be surprised in the coming years uh, that uh, that there aren't more calls for contracts, standing contracts and resources needed by the federal government to respond uh, to the uh, increasing number of emergencies and disasters that we're going to be dealing with. And that would that's going to require increased collaboration. You know, uh, you know, we're, we're really good at collaborating with our state partners uh, and our state partners are really good about collaborating with our local responders. Uh, but then, you know, we got to take that next step and start collaborating across, um, you know, our various uh, technical uh, engineering uh, and health based disciplines. And that provides the whole of government response. Um, you know, when, when government leads uh, and, um, and, and the experts support, um, that's, uh, that's what makes a successful response. And, and hopefully, um, you know, the lessons learned from uh, this incident uh, can drive us forward uh, in, into that uh, into that uh, very necessary future. So with that, um, I appreciate you all uh, sticking around and uh, listening and thanks to all of you uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for taking the time. And uh, uh, for those of you that may have uh, supported our uh, efforts in one way or another, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't, uh, can't express our appreciation enough. It's been a tough one. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. I mean, incredibly informative, uh, grateful, grateful, grateful. If I might ask, maybe if we if we kill the slide share, then you and Dave and I might show up slightly bigger in here. Although maybe people would prefer to see the slides rather than us, but <laughs> but maybe we can chat a little bit in here. So um, first of all, thank you uh, behalf of the academy. I know I speak for Dave and behalf of Neha. Thanks for all the work that is going on. Thanks to all the experts, the environmental health uh, professionals that are out there, the environmental scientists. The environmental engineers, uh, you know, the whole of government, local, everybody that's responding. So uh, we certainly appreciate you and we certainly appreciate all the expertise that's going into this. Um, Mark, what we're going to do, I'm going to kind of go through and just quickly hit a few of the little bit more like technical specific ones just to get your mind kind of thinking in the background. And then I'm going to hand off to Dave to have a little bit more of kind of a high level, the lessons learned, the, the broader, and then I'll come back in with some of the little bit more specific ones. So just some of the specific ones we picked up in, you know, people were wondering like, well, what caused the derailment in the first place, right? And who decided that we that the response was a, was a vent and burn? 
And once that fire is going, what damage to the auxiliary buildings around and nearby? And so, you know, then we get into the, you know, the issues of, okay, so folks are responding. There's the incident command, there's NCP. You know, what part of NCP requires the consistency? How, how do we know that we're actually meeting that? When you get into the, the, the air system, so was the dioxin information available before the decision was made for the vent and burn, or was that a, after the fact? You know, what, how quickly was the air monitoring brought into place? When you move into the water, there's a wastewater treatment system. So do we know what technology, what's the nature of the receiving streams? Are there contaminants in the stream? And if so, what? Um, when we're thinking about the soil contamination, where's that soil going now, right? Um, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, the the Norfolk Southern and the, and the long-term role, you know, some of the questions like, you know, who's paying? Is this going to courts or is FEMA involved? You know, like, how is some of that stuff playing out? You know, what kind of health is being measured of these people in the long term? You know, are we, are we taking blood samples? Are we looking at general health? And, and then, you know, the political implications. I mean, of course, you know, the little Chernobyl, um, it's a, it, it is a big deal. It's a huge deal to the folks there. And, and none of us would minimize that. But yeah, Chernobyl was a very different kind of thing. This is, you know, from a technical standpoint, this is not a little Chernobyl, but it is still a huge significant event. And how do we, you know, how do we put that forward and communicate that? So that's some of the, the more specific nuts and bolts that we'll come back maybe to, but I'm going to hand off to Dave uh, to kind of, you know, offer any thoughts he has, but then that, to, you know, to, to start us off in a more general space, and then we'll come back with some of those more specific. Dave? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'd like you to answer each of those questions by memory <laughs> uh, that, that that Dan just presented. I, as you were talking, and I'm racing through my mind about the, the vapor density of vinyl chloride and its boiling point, and all the old chemistry started to come back to me. And then you, you, you discussed this public health advisory unit can you walk us through what you learned in taking highly technical chemical and physics kinds of decision making and breaking that down for folks who are also equally educated, but not perhaps in chemistry or physics or combustion technology? And how did that public health unit work? And what did you learn from that process? Sure. So let, let's first talk about you know, the, you know, the emergency phase now. Um, I wasn't there the first two weeks. I, I got deployed um, uh, shortly after the vent and burn, well, about a week and a half after the vent and burn happened. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, having extensive conversations with our on-scene coordinators um, uh, uh, who are who were on scene then, you know, we our typical public health outreach is uh, through our uh, local health departments, of course, in this case, Columbiana County Health Department. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the state health department, the Ohio Department of Health, and then the, the partner agencies on the Pennsylvania side were doing, you know, were, were engaged. But from from EPA standpoint, we first start with the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR. We uh, we quickly go through the manifesto, what they call the consist of uh, uh, chemicals that were on that uh, train car, uh, evaluate them. Evaluate what the, uh, the the highest priority uh, chemicals are for uh, you know for uh, offsite migration issues, vapor issues, um, and um, start just trekking down the list. Uh, what what are what are our response uh, our response actions or what are our monitoring points um, uh, for these locations? Not only for worker safety but also for community safety. And we quickly were able to get a list from uh, ATSDR of uh, the compounds uh, that were uh, most of concern. There were a lot of glycols involved in this train derailment, not, not a big air hazard. Um, but um, uh, but the, uh, the vinyl chloride, the acrylates, uh, the benzene, uh, the benzene uh, residual, um, and uh, uh, the, the tube butoxyethanol were the, the compounds that we were most concerned about. And they gave us um, uh, response actions for, again, response workers and for, uh, uh, for the community. They helped us establish the, the baseline early in the emergency phase for you know what what to monitor for and, and what would be our turn back levels, um, and uh, we integrated the local and, and state health uh, partners in you know uh, within that process, and so that that that's where the emergency uh, piece stepped in. Then when we when the evacuation was established for the vent and burn operation, and um, 
uh, before that evacuation was lifted, um, the uh, the health partners needed to agree on what um, what levels for each particular contaminant would be acceptable, both for general air monitoring with photo or flame ionization detectors, and also for uh, analytical sampling. Um, so it, it got complex very fast, and uh, uh, as uh, the uh, the return to uh, home process was happening, some of those levels were actually adjusted to be more conservative because we were dealing with a chemical mixture as opposed to just one right. single chemical. So, um, and, and, you know, it, it's easy to talk about that with those of us who understand, you know, that, you know, the, 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 the nuances of, of air monitoring and, uh, and, uh, and exposure. It's not so easy, as I mentioned earlier, and, and part of our lessons learned to talk about talk about that to the public and yes we're seeing we're seeing um, uh, levels below what we would expect uh, to see um, for uh, for uh, community response actions but we can still smell it so we still know it's present right. um, but again they're not at levels that are that are hazardous so um so that's that, that, that it's the communication challenges that get that get really really hard to deal with um I, i'm not sure if i answered your question but you know i just I, I, what I really wanted to express was that, you know, you know, all the health agencies uh, were at the table um, advising on these action levels that we were establishing both on site and for the community. Yeah, thanks. I, I like to say that the action is in the space between the professions. And I think you just described that where there was a collaboration among and between federal, state and local players that could in aggregate meet the needs of the local community. Thank you. Dan, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. So, so Mark, now we're you now you know D yeah. Dave kind of we got the we got the discussion going. I'm sure he'll jump in some with these, and, and you know, but now we also I I kind of picked up and tracked, and I kind of lumped together, right? Um, and I realize asking any expert to try to answer the breadth of all this is going to be a lot. So, you know, I'll, I'll I'll defer to you to be able to say, well, you know, we actually would have to go and look at that, yeah. but. But let's start with some of these, and we'll we'll go through them, and we'll clip we'll clip them off, um, and defer when we need to. What caused the derailment in the first place? Yep, you know, I, we I talked to our our emergency contact at the Federal Railroad Administration, and you know what they uh, so I, I don't know the specific answer to that first of all. So that's that's uh, let's qualify it. But but he he had mentioned that you know just from a, a railroad management standpoint, um, you know. That it didn't look like there were any any violations. Um, however, um, you know, the he also noted that the NTSB investigation would determine whether or not that were, were to be the case. Um, so it it see, it looks like there was a, uh, a, a from what I understand from uh, from NT, the NTSB initial findings and in, in, in the hearings that there was a uh, a bearing uh, one of the wheel bearings was failing, and that's what eventually would cause a derailment. Because a lot of us are always wondering, right? I mean, these rail lines go through all of our towns and communities, and it's like, well, am I next, right? And so it's like it's good to understand that that early on. So again, a question that I'm sure everybody on here would have an interest in. You know, we look at NCP, we look at the idea of you know hazardous and oil and oil waste response and all. And you were you did a great job laying out incident command and you know and national and regional and and partners and all. Can you help us understand, is, it, is that section 300-115 that looks at that, you know, the regional response? Or can you help us understand that a little bit? Uh, and it is section 300. I can't cite the uh, the exact portion, oh. uh, part of the uh, um, uh, of the NCP that, that states it. But, you know, bottom bottom line, uh, Dan, and, and, and to everybody else participating, um, you know, all responses are local, right? Uh, they start local, uh, and uh, and then they they and they they build. And when we determine uh, that you know, this is an NCP response, where uh, the federal government needs to take a leadership role, um, that's where the, the the whole governance of the NCP you know comes into play. Um, utilizing the regional response teams if necessary. Um, you know uh, the requirements for uh, you know public uh, you know public outreach and um, uh, requirements for the responsible parties. To uh, be compliant with the uh, uh, you know with the uh, direction uh, that the federal uh, official, the on-scene coordinator, offers, um, uh, and the the expectation of uh, doing a multi uh, multi agency response. And again, we today we call that unified command. Um, early in this response, we were working uh, under Ohio EPA's lead. 
Um, Ohio EPA, uh, we responded independently. Ohio EPA was probably an hour away from calling us anyway. Uh, but we actually, funny story, we actually had uh, one of our on-scene coordinators out of our uh, West Virginia, Wheeling, West Virginia uh, field office. He moonlights as a hazmat tech for uh, uh, for uh, for Beaver County, Pennsylvania. He was on scene and he's the one who called us and said, you know, send the horses. This is a big one. Uh, this is the biggest one I've ever seen. So we were on, we, we were mobilized at the site before the state called us. The state uh, reached out to us. Uh, they said we we need uh, extensive air monitoring support. So that was our role early on. We were supporting the state. We anticipated after the vent and burn operation happened um, that we would start to uh, reduce our footprint and the state uh, would take over for long-term remediation. A couple of things happened though that changed that. A, um, the, the public perception went through the roof as, as we all know. And B, uh, when uh, Norfolk Southern made the decision um, to reestablish their rails on contaminated soil uh, and start running uh, cars again, we knew we needed the full force of uh, the federal family to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, establish the order to make sure that this cleanup was done complete and, and thorough. So the NCP became the driver um, after, uh, after those a couple of events happened. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I know you you just put a smile on on, on Dave Dijak and, and everybody at Neha, right? All all environmental health is local, right, Dave? That's what we start nice. with. So I, I I saw the smile come across your face because that's a that's a that's a, a a mantra there, and so it kind of leads into the next kind of detail-y question mark, right? But you know, we we think about first responders and somebody, you know, you know police and fire on the scene, right? And then we think about kind of the second responders where, you know, where we mobilize folks with with additional technical expertise and equipment. You know, one of the questions that's been Monday morning quarterbacked is the decision to vent and burn. And, you know, you were very clear. I mean, it's about protecting life and then property and environment and the priorities and and how that gets made. I guess a, a, a quick question is, the kind of the you know the, there seems to be a little bit in the public the confusion right was the derailment the the ignition or was it a true after the fact we made a decision to burn and if so then then who decided that and then the technical question this dioxin information and the map of that was was that known before the decision was made or is that kind of after the fact now we know the burns there let's look what happened sure uh, you know, the, the decision, the, let's start with the decision. Uh, the decision uh, ultimately was made by the incident commander, um, which was the local fire chief. But he did that in consultation with uh, the state responders. Um, we provided advice on whether or not we could establish enough air monitoring downwind, uh, because the modeling we did showed a pretty significant impact downwind. And that's why, uh, you know, in the, uh, the one mile by two mile evacuation zone was set. But I, the way I like to answer that question is, what if I, as an on-scene coordinator, was asked uh, that question? If the technical expert, which uh, you know, Norfolk Southern brought uh, yeah, onto the scene, the technical expert says, this is what needs to be done, who am I to say no? Um, now, I'm not gonna risk uh, a, a blevy or an explosion when an expert is telling me uh, otherwise. And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't fault the decision. Uh, there are going to be, um, uh, I'm sure there are going to be a lot more uh, enforcement cases that, um, you know, uh, figure all that out. But I can tell you that if I were making that decision, I would have made the same decision. Now, um, with respect to dioxins, I, when the dioxin um, concerns uh, were raised, um, uh, that was not going to change the decision to do what was done, right? But when the dioxin concerns were raised, we reached out to our experts, um, you know, within EPA, and, and we, we we have some pretty solid experts in this in this area. We've been we've been working, especially even in our region. We we have one of the largest dioxin sites in the country in our in our region. Um, we uh, we consulted them, uh, our experts, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the you know the uh, the volume or the mass of dioxin uh, generated shouldn't be that much. But they said keep an eye on the amount of hydrogen chloride phosgene. And then the chlorophenols and the uh, and some of the other uh, primary and secondary breakdown products. If you start to see those elevated, you may have a dioxin problem, right? Those th those indicator chemicals, those primary and secondary indicator chemicals. Um, well, once we had the uh, analytical data and the monitoring data, you know, showed us that dioxins probably weren't um, a significant um, impact. They're there uh, in in the waste samples themselves, which is be the which be the most concentrated part of the dioxins. We're seeing somewhere between 800 and 1,000 parts per trillion, you know, which is even below our, our, our historic, um, you know, residential uh, action level. So 
So again, they were formed, there were impacts, but they were not significant. Um, and uh, you know, they, uh, the assessment work we've done demonstrates that. I think you had mentioned one of the questions where, you know, why didn't we do some air sampling for that, uh, for that particular contaminant? That's a good question. I wasn't on scene when, uh, when, uh, that, uh, uh, when those decisions were made, uh, but I do know that the, the science really didn't support the need, so. Makes sense. May yeah, you know, Dave. I know you. I know this is an area that Nihal also is very interested in, just like the academy. You know, the credentials, the certifications, right? I mean, having experts and then having experts know how to work together. Um, I don't know if you've got any observations or any questions for Mark in that space, but I know that environmental engineering and science we might we might be a little bit more siloed in our regard. But I know Niha and environmental health uh, practitioners tend to be in that multi interface, multi credential space as well a lot. Yeah, I I can say with confidence that uh, we are the Swiss Army knife of environmental health uh, of the public health professions. I, uh, let me rephrase that, where our our technical subject matter experts may know water, they may know food, they may know soil, they may know air, they may know indoor air, uh, but they spread themselves kind of thin investigating each of these and working in each of these spaces virtually daily. They would not have the level of expertise to address some of the complexities that, that you're describing. For example, you mentioned a PID or an FID. I don't think my constituents are working with that type of technology on a day-to-day -day basis. Hence my earlier question about breaking some of this stuff down, right? We learned this in uh, university uh, chemistry, organic uh, classes, but it's like, are we doing real-time sampling? Uh, what is that real-time sampling telling us versus taking stuff back to the lab and taking a couple of days to get, to get those kinds of results? And of course, the, the public is on a knife's edge during all of this and trying to triage those types of inquiries with the best available information. That must have been really difficult uh, in terms of trying to be transparent, trying to address dis and misinformation, which you had mentioned earlier. Uh, maybe you could comment on that. The, and this was one of the questions that came in. Given the complexity of this, uh, was there a, an, a, a professional risk communicator that was brought in or was the PIO just a usual and customary public information officer? Uh, sorry, and I, I don't mean, yeah, I don't mean we, uh, I'm, not criti so I'm not criticizing the PIO. I'm just, I'm, I'm, no, I'm responding to one of the no, questions no, that no, was no. submitted. No, it's all good. It's all good. And actually, uh, it's a great question, uh, Dave. And um, so there's, it's a two-part answer. One, you know, that the bridge, and that, that, a big shout out to ATSDR, right? Um, uh, uh, ATSDR is that bridge between the work that we do and the public health community. Um, that, you know, they, you know, they, they have that the, the toxicology expertise. They have the knowledge of, well, you know, the functionality of our, uh, you know, of our field response equipment and uh, the sampling tactics that we use uh, to evaluate um, you know, the, the health of these environments. So, um, you know, ATSDR uh, brought out um, a significant team early in the response, our regional representative and um, our, uh, their, uh, you know, their headquarters out of Atlanta and support from uh, region, uh, region three as well, um, all converged uh, to provide that support. In addition to that, in our welcome center, once we stood that up, we did bring a toxicologist into the welcome center. And um, I remember when uh, his name was Keith. And when Keith left, we had residents coming in. Hey, we want to talk to Keith again. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and they were stuck with me sometimes. But but uh, yeah, yeah, we did have um, you know some very skilled people at communicating very complicated public health issues and uh, and comparing them to you know the environmental monitoring. Uh, that was being done and sampling that was being done, and so we did. We did have that capability on scene between uh, our uh, ATSDR partners, our public health partners um, uh, at all levels, and uh, and uh, and our toxic internal toxicologists. Fantastic. Thanks, well, Dan. Now I'll drill down. I was going to say I was going to ask Pete some questions, but I can you know, but Dave, I can I can pause. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I could dominate this, Dan, for the rest of uh, like the afternoon. I don't want to do that. I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Fantastic. So maybe let me let me hit a couple more of like the your more specific ones drill down as well. You know, so so, you know, so now there's, there's a control burn. There's a big fire that's been there. Right. So um, 
you know, collateral damage, buildings nearby, where people are living, you know, FEMA, all that kind of stuff. Can can you take us through? So so how are we controlling dust? What are we doing with these structures that are maybe damaged by the heat of the fire? What what's going on with with those details? Let's start with uh, let's start with structures first. So um, uh, th this and this is the amazing uh, part. Uh, you you saw you saw all the images of this fire early on. No buildings got damaged um, significantly. Um, you know there there was there, there was some minor uh, minor and very minor damage to um, some buildings, but you know the one closest to the Rama site, the one that you saw in the in the foreground of the picture and all those images uh, that I was showing, um, you know because they were so close uh, to uh, uh, you know the uh, the incident in the Benton Burn locations, uh, they uh, they. Norfolk Southern took responsibility for that business, um, and they've been paying their employees ever since. So they're not—they're no longer there. That that property itself is really where the majority of our staging is uh, for waste and uh, for a lot, a lot of our uh, hot zone um, equipment. Um, but the you know the rest of the the rest of the uh, buildings to the west, um, uh, uh, businesses to the west are active. Some of the residents really close um, on you know on on the uh, street side uh, of those buildings, not on the, uh, the railway side. Um, some of them decided they didn't want to leave uh, through the temporary relocation program. Um, you know, we've made a point to talk to many of them, um, uh, you know, and, um, you know, just, you know, just help them understand what's going on and keep them updated. Um, there, there was a, a tavern and a, a residential structure and one other business, um, a, a petroleum business uh, that was also uh, on the Western side, I'm sorry, on the Eastern side that, that needed to shut down because they were so close to the uh, the vapor uh, generation areas. But again, I, I I'm not aware of any. Uh, there were no total loss buildings, uh, and so uh, that I find that to be remarkable given uh, how yeah. you know, how extensive. I mean, from from the news, it looked like pretty intense and the giant yeah. plume and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah, I could see where well a, a couple of, a couple of quick technical ones then right because of course then you know we've got engineers and scientists and health professionals on here right so the engineers are asking me okay so what wastewater treatment system is this right yeah. so is this like a membrane is this carbon is this daf is this you know like and then and then where is all that soil going once you've excavated it right i mean you know incinerate yeah. on site incinerate someplace else and then disposed where so if you can speak to those very you know, kind of very technical nuts and bolts, yeah. environmental engineering science questions. So. Yeah, so let's let's start with the the soil because that's easy. Um, uh, the the uh, the currently the wastewater is going to deep well injection, as I mentioned earlier. The uh, soil, um, the incinerators, they are not nothing on site. Everything's going to a, a regulated, uh, circla approved um, uh, hazardous waste incinerator. Uh, I think there are three that we're currently using, or at least have been using. Um, the uh, soil are all going to subtitle C hazardous waste landfills. So, um, so those are all going to hazardous waste landfills. Um, and um, if you, I'm sure some of some some listening remember in the early days that um, none of the states wanted to take our waste um, again because of the misinformation out there about what was in this waste. But uh, you know, um, I got to give uh, uh, two thumbs up to the state of Indiana. Uh, your governor made a decision to take the waste. Um, when, uh, but he wanted dioxin sampling done. Dioxin sampling was done. It matched the, the sampling that we had done on site. It was for waste purposes. It was very low levels. Um, and they, they opened up um, uh, that uh, particular landfill. Now, um, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the federal, uh, there are federal laws that prohibit um, uh, the, uh, that practice of, um, of shutting down interstate commerce. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to go there. Um, uh, so um, and once one state um, opened, uh, you know, opened up the doors and the rest of the states followed suit. So we haven't had a problem getting our, uh, our uh, the waste to the hazardous waste landfills. Regarding the water treatment system, um, it's uh, it, it, I, I, I can't remember what what technology they're using to uh, flock, flock out the, uh, the solids. Uh, but long story short, it's going through sand filters, activated carbon um after it, after the solids are removed um and that's uh, that's the process is pretty straightforward pretty phys pretty straightforward physical chemical treatment process yeah. so yeah, makes makes sense makes sense this one will ble bleed over uh, you know into into the the Neha space as well right but one of the questions that was there was you know the the kind of the who's paying and how long is health being monitored of whom right because i mean of course there's the occupational side which is right up next to what you know Neha folks think about, and you know, but then there's also the residential side, right? And the thing about the children, and think about the long term. So maybe if you you know could speak to that, and Dave, I'll let you kind of follow up if you've got something in that. 
So I'm, yeah, in the public health space, so the, 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 let's compartmentalize that into three spaces here. Uh, the first uh, is ATSDR. Um, yeah, ATSDR did what they call their assessment of chemical exposure surveys, both for first responders and um, for, uh, 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 for community members. And that was on the heels of uh, our state health agencies doing uh, initial health surveys. And the, the surveys that came back from the, the, the state health departments and then uh, through ATSDR to support our state health departments, um, you know, showed uh, very similar patterns of, of, um, of health issues, symptoms uh, that were present uh, during the early days of the response. So, um, so compartment number one was state health service. Compartment number two was the assessment of chemical exposure surveys separated into two compartments. One was for first responders. One was for, um, uh, for uh, the community. Then the last piece of it, uh, uh, the state of Ohio set up a, uh, they funded a clinic uh, that anybody who was impacted by the terrain derailment would have access to that clinic for terrain derailment related um, health issues for at least one year. So for the, uh, from now until next, I believe May, uh, March or May, I think it's May, uh, that clinic uh, will be available for uh, for health derailment related uh, issues. So, in the short term, um, there is uh, there there are health uh, there are, there is health support available uh, for those impacted. In the longer term, that's one of the things that the community uh, has uh, uh, been asking for. Uh, they've uh, they've been petitioning um, their states. They've been petitioning the federal government uh, for long term longer term care. Um, even uh, you know as far you know as far down the road as lifetime care. I, I don't know where that's going to go, um, but that's one of the things that um, uh, the community uh, is asking for. Okay. Well, let's let's riff on that just a little bit, Mark. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that OSHA was invited into the Unified Command. I, I struck me is like why did he mention that? Is that unusual? And mm -hmm. if it is unusual. What, yes. what what tipped that decision into having OSHA versus just a, a, a usual and customary health and safety component? Yeah, two two things that uh, we're doing that uh, are not typical. A, having our health and safety officer on the ground in the dirt uh, every day. Um, typically, they're either in a response trailer uh, or in, 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 in the office and, and they're sending out assistant safety officers uh, to do their work on, on large events. Uh, the decision to bring OSHA in is because there was a magnifying glass on this response. Um, you know, as soon as uh, as soon as EPA um, you know uh, established its administrative order, uh, you know, we we brought the unified command partners together under in the the incident command framework. Um, and more formally, it was there, but it wasn't as formal. Once we brought that in, uh, that was one of the first decisions we made. That you know what we need to we need to be solid on on, on the health and safety end of this um, because. The health and safety with the work with the workforce then bleeds into um, uh, confidence in the community, and uh, and it just it, it you know it, it was almost a no brainer for us. And but Dave, you're right; it is unusual. Uh, you know, most of the big ones we do, we might bring OSHA in, um, you know, to you know, to to do an audit um, just to make sure that our contractors are doing what they should be doing. But this one, I, we just it just felt like the right thing to do. So it was a gut reaction, <laughs> uh, but I, I it was the right decision. Okay, I th thank you for that. So it was a gut decision. And I think, you know, for people emerging into this career track of environmental engineering and environmental health, uh, we, we often want really explicit answers to questions. And what you just said is you went with your gut. It was, and I, I think that's a really important distinction that you just made. There, there's a lot of experience and going with your gut that needs to be applied, that can be reviewed on, by Monday morning quarterbacks later, uh, but going, uh, being professionally prepared and, and just doing the best you can is, is frankly, uh, perhaps all we can expect of the human beings out on, on the front lines. How, having said that, can, can you talk about the hot wash if one has been uh, conducted? And a hot wash is an after action kind of review uh, upon reflection, are, are you in a place to share with the audience, what did you learn from this? Or, or what were the bigger surprises around the, the public health uh, response to this or, and the engineering response to this? Is, is there any take home messages you'd like to leave with us today? Well, I think I, I, I think I mentioned those already, Dave. Um, you know, uh, you know, when, when the, uh, 
when all eyes are on, um, you know, the efforts uh, that you're putting forth, um, uh, and uh, and you know that the cycle of misinformation starts. Uh, it, you know, that I think the biggest the, the biggest lesson learned for us is we need to figure that out, um, and we need to figure out how to communicate in in uh, in this age of uh, digital information. Um, you know, and uh, you know. You know, many of our many of the media reports that come out about this site are are outstanding, but some of them are not, uh, and because they're they're uh, they're basing some of their reporting on bad information, and um, we need to figure that out um, because you know getting the right hand getting the right information in, in into the hands of uh, the people who need it the most, which are those who uh, are impacted, the community members. Uh, it's so vital that they, you know, that they have the right information to make their uh, make make their decisions for their families and their businesses. You know that that's that's going to be the number one thing that comes out of is is the communication challenges uh, on major events like this. Um, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to to track on what's happening over in Hawaii right now. Um, you know, with that disaster, um, just because we're still working <laughs> twelve to fourteen hour hour days out here still, but. I'm sure they're uh, probably experiencing some of the same challenges out there. Um, this is more of a classic disaster, um, but still, um, I, I've got to imagine that they're they're, they're going to they're going to be struggling with some of the same information challenges. And you yeah, asked the question. You asked the question. Did we do a hot wash yet? The answer is no. Uh, we just haven't had time. Uh, you know, uh, you know, everything that I threw at you guys on those last couple slides was right off the cuff. So, um, so it's again, it's it's a little more raw uh, than than uh, than the polished version of our lessons lessons learned. It'll come out uh, later on. Well, well, thanks. I one of the messages I took from you is we all need a Keith uh, embedded in each of our uh, operational units. So this is. <laughs> This is the Keith rule. Uh, I don't know who Keith is, but you're about to become famous, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Keith, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, you know, Mark, I, you know, I, I, on behalf of the uh, American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists and the National Environmental Health Association, and all of us joined here and, and Dr. Dijek, um, and particularly Jim Fitzgerald and the, the Site Remediation Committee from the Academy put this together. Uh, thank you to you uh, for being here for an exceptional webinar. This was incredibly informative. You've, you've kept the audience with it through the whole thing. So Mark, kudos to you and thanks and, and Godspeed and carry on in the fantastic work you're doing. Um, you are a, a testament to exceptional performance in the environmental health, engineering and science space, and we're grateful for you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, Jim, Marissa, I appreciate you all. And um, and uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'll get to them when I can. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Marissa to do our outro. Marissa. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for all your questions. And thank you to our speakers for sharing your knowledge today. If you have any additional questions on this topic, please reach out to me and I'm happy to put you in touch. And thank you again to Dr. Other for sponsoring this event. We do have several webinars planned in the near future, so you can go to aaes.org slash events to check them out and register. If you're interested in sponsoring an upcoming webinar, please reach out to me directly. And just a reminder, if you're not yet an AAES member and you're considering joining the Academy, please email me to discuss our membership options. Last but not, not least, the PDH certificates for this event will be sent out shortly. That's all for now. We enjoyed being with you all today. Thank you so much and have a great day.